very interesting and compelling, and you can see how there are um, themes that go across these talks in terms of form and dose and method of delivery that are going to be um, uh, very pertinent to the conversations that we're going to be having uh, later. So we have one more talk um, uh, left this afternoon. Uh, we're now going to go to the kidney and talk about homeostasis um, uh, with um, chronic kidney uh, disease. And you know, Kisler. Kisler, thank you. I did not want to slaughter Dr. Kisler's last name coming here from Vanderbilt. So thank you very much, and we look forward I, I, to your talk. Thank you. I heard many different versions of it, so I'm used to it. Don't worry. <laughs> Just you can say whatever you like. So uh, again, uh, as everybody said, I would like to uh, thank, thank all the organizers and appreciate the invitation to be here. It's so nice to see that you know kidneys are also a part of the, the process here. And again, uh, I'm given 20 minutes, and I'm using every second of it. Uh, 20 minutes is hard. Having completed a 20-hour course in nutrition and kidney disease, it's going to be hard for me to put it all into one uh, short talk. So I'll try to be as concise as possible. And there's, uh, there are a lot of things to talk about, so I just didn't know what to do. I thought I'll just sort of go back to the questions, as everybody did, and try to go over those questions one by one and giving you some examples, some generalized comments about the nutrition and the metabolism and the relevance of diet and chronic kidney disease. And these are the questions that I were posed for the uh, session. So I'm going to go ahead and start with the first two. That is, what is the disease itself and how it is managed? And then talk about a little bit of the epidemiology of nutritional aspects of kidney disease and give you some idea about the biological mechanisms. So in contrast to most of the talks I listened to this morning, which was really, really informative for me and I've learned a lot, kidney disease is very common. Uh, it's in 1 in 20 adults in the United States. Uh, there are about 20 million individuals with chronic kidney disease if you were to go around and look and check your creatinines. About half a million individuals are on maintenance dialysis, peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis. I don't know how many people know about the difference between those two, but that's a quite a bit of uh, number of people in an everyday, three times a week uh, schedule. There are about 125,000 individuals who start dialysis every given year in the United States alone. And uh, there are about 60,000 new transplants a year. So there's an accumulation of these individuals over time. And the difference between the numbers is because of the fact that the mortality rate in the setting of end-stage renal disease is about 20% per year. So we lose a substantial amount of individuals in this process. And I will say, I'm not going to go into too much detail, that nutritional status, as with any other chronic disease state, is one of the, if not the most important, significant predictor of their outcomes. That is, the ones that have a better nutritional state are more likely to live. And again, interestingly enough, uh, despite being only uh, less than 1% of the whole Medicare population, about 4 to 5% of all Medicare costs go for kidney disease and stage renal disease. It's a substantial burden in the, in the system itself. So what is the nutrition, how the nutrition is relevant to that? There are multiple reasons that nutrition can be important in the setting of chronic kidney disease. Uh, when I see patients in the clinic, uh, the one and the most important question that the patients ask is how am I going to be adapting my diet to the process? It is very patient relevant. Uh, so there are many things that one can talk about, but I like to mention that we also have to deal with a sort of a nutritional problem called protein energy wasting, which is PEW, which I'm going to refer to going forward. Uh, that is highly prevalent in this patient population. And for the sake of simplicity, uh, when we talk about kidney disease, we talk about chronic kidney disease not on dialysis, people with some residual kidney function, and people that are on dialysis that are dialysis patients. And if you look at multiple biomarkers, protein energy wasting is present in about 12 to 18 percent of all patients with chronic kidney disease. The more interesting aspect of things is that when you switch the patients on dialysis, the prevalence of this unique abnormality is actually 30 to 65 percent. There's almost a tripling of this problem in the setting of end-stage renal disease, and that sort of speaks to the complexity of the problem. So why does that happen? I'm a nephrologist. I like things complicated because kidney disease is complicated. <laughs> so uh, it is, uh, suffice to say, I'm not going to go over this, but I'm just going to tell you <laughs> Uh, I am interested in one single aspect of this whole thing for the last 25 years. But 
as one of the speakers, Dr. Berry, specifically pointed out, and astutely pointed out, that things are connected to each other. Everything talks to each other, and nutrition stands in the middle of everything else. So it's not like a simple process in a silo that does things, but it's a process that happens in the whole body. And all of these abnormalities are correlated and connected to each other. This is a simplified version of why kidney disease leads to protein energy wasting. There are multiple reasons. As with anyone that's interested in nutrition, we all know that protein energy wasting, sarcopenia, wasting syndrome itself, when nutrition does not kill people in the developed countries, it's the complications that are associated with protein energy wasting, such as, uh, I need to go back here, but uh, uh, such as these infection, cardiovascular disease, and frailty that really put patients at risk. So the next question is, is, what is the evidence that there is a nutritional requirement that is different than that of the healthy population? And that's a very specific comment. I would say uh, we've been doing this for many years, and there are a number of studies that has uh, established the, the need for additional or less of the nutrients that we usually give to healthy individuals. I just wanted to give you this slide. I'll show this again at the very end. This is the summary of the requirements for the major nutrients that we're really interested in in the setting of kidney disease. I will tell you for any case, any time, for any place where you really look at the kidney disease itself, there's a difference in terms of non-dialysis kidney patients, patients on hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. So we cannot put them all into one basket and say everybody gets this and everybody's going to be needing this or that. So we have to really individualize the dietary requirements as well as the supplementation or limitation or restrictions for each patient's background and the level of kidney function. And one thing that I will show you here is again very important that uh, micronutrients, especially the protein intake, is significantly different in the setting of kidney disease at different stages of kidney disease. And compared to the general population, there's a substantial increase in the need for protein supplementation in these individuals, and that's what I'm going to go into detail for the next couple of minutes. Again, not to make this any more complicated, but we have to really apply this more personalized precision medicine approach to kidney disease in terms of nutrition, because certain nutrient intakes could be completely contradictory to each other in the setting of different stages. Just to give you an example, protein intake, as I will show you, is actually uh, recommended to be limited in the setting of chronic kidney disease, because there are studies to suggest that higher protein intakes, greater than 1.0 or 1.2 grams per kilogram per day, could be associated with worsening of pro progression of kidney disease. And I'll show you data that if you actually restrict the intake, there may be benefit for slowing down the progression. Whereas if you go to end-stage renal disease, there's the syndrome of protein wasting, and there's a substantial need for additional protein. So you cannot really go and tell a patient that you're going to be eating the same amount of protein all the way through. The same applies for calorie. Actually, this is something that has been overseen in the setting of kidney disease. A lot of times for end-stage renal disease, we really encourage patients to eat a lot because we have this uh, epidemiology of chronic disease. I do not call it a reverse epidemiology or anything like that. We see it in every chronic disease state where you need a lot of calories and the patients, more obese they are, the better they do. Whereas in the setting of chronic kidney disease, obese patients actually progress their kidneys much faster. There's data to suggest that obesity is associated with induced progression of disease interglomerally and otherwise. So there is a contradictory or complex process here too. There are also some common derangements that are actually need to be taken care of at every stage of kidney disease, which I'm not going to go into detail, such as the limitation of salt, phosphorus, managing hyperkalemia, bone mineral disorders. And again, there's also a huge interest in the setting of kidney disease in terms of metabolic disorders, which I'll mention a few slides about inflammation. Going back to this slide that I've shown you, I will talk about three things, which I think will sort of exemplify why there is a need for increased uh, protein intake in the setting of end-stage renal disease, or the opposite, there's a need for less. And these are hemodialysis-associated catabolism, dietary nutrient intake in terms of not being able to ingest much, and then the effect of inflammation in the setting of both of those, how it really influences the metabolic profile of these individuals. <clears throat> First of all, for anyone who's gone to medical school, and there are a number of individuals here, the hallmark of uremia is anorexia. We used to establish patients with chronic kidney disease in terms of when they were need to be initiated on dialysis, when they really, really become anorectic and cannot eat anything. 
And we know now that there's a progression of this decrease of intake of nutrients, especially proteins, as the GFR glomerular filtration rate goes down. When you have a GFR greater than 60, your intake is almost normal. Whereas if you go down below to 30 or less than 15, your intake spontaneously goes down, and it, that is associated with uh, uremia itself. And once the dialysis is initiated, there is some reversal of this problem. But we do know that despite it's a life-saving opportunity and a process, dialysis in itself is inadequate to really replace the original kidney function. So this initial improvement actually subsides over time, three to four years or so. Well, if you really think about it, restricting protein really makes sense for a lot of patients. And again, it's not because the uremic toxins are really causing a bad thing, but they're really trying to limit the amount of protein uh, being metabolized and the toxins being produced with this process. We all know that we take about 70 grams a day of protein, depending on where you live. If you live in Tennessee, it's probably double or Texas triple. But in general, that's what people eat. And then this goes to your amino acid pool. There's the plasma proteins and then cellular proteins. And there's this whole process that leads to excretion of these nitrogen, which we call as a group the, uh, the uremic toxins. And what happens is if you eat more of those, you produce more uremic toxins, and you get more nauseated, you get more sick. So what do you do is you just don't eat. And that's a way of really maladaptively adapting to this process of not eating too much. And that leads to a decrease in appetite and decrease of nutrient intake. But again, if the dialysis commences, there's another problem. And for people who, ever, who has ever looked at the dialysis, thought about the concept, what we do is a simple filtering of nutrients. And we really need to get rid of BUN and creatinine and everything else. But when we dialyze people, we also get rid of some essential nutrients, such as amino acids. And the reason for that is very simple. This whole filtering process in the dialysis actually gets rid of small molecules. Amino acids are small molecules. And this is a study that we've done many, many years ago showing that this, regardless of the type of dialysis you do, you lose about six to eight grams of protein, uh, amino acids a day every time you dialyze. This is half for PD, but this is daily, so on a cumulative basis, you lose substantial amount of amino acids every time you dialyze somebody. And this is an inevitable process that leads to a decrease in terms of nutrient intake. Now, the net product of this is actually as you decrease your uh, I mean, acid pool, that leads to increased catabolism, a decreased synthesis, that leads to robust net catabolism in the setting of dialysis. This is a study we've done looking at the protein turnover using stable isotopes, and this is a simple process for audience here. This is these bars, the yellow bars show the protein breakdown, the, blue, the green bars are the synthesis, and the net balance is the difference between the two. This is before dialyzing anyone in the setting of fasting. This is the four hours of dialysis, and this is two hours after dialysis when the dialysis is completely finished. As you can see, there's a significant drop in the protein synthesis, a significant increase in the protein breakdown, and the net balance is almost a doubling of this net catabolic process. Now, if it's once, that's okay. That's like, if you really look at it, that's running about a mile or two miles or three miles. So that's how much your proteins you break down. But if you do it three times a week, 152 times a year, that's a lot of running that you cannot compensate for. And one thing that is really important here that even if you finish dialysis, despite the fact that the synthetic rate goes back to normal where it started, the catabolic process continues. And that's probably because of the fact that there's activation of the complement system and subsequently the inflammatory pathway that activates IL-6 and other inflammatory, pro-inflammatory cytokines. So dialysis itself not only loses proteins, but also activates a metabolic profile that's really bad for you. And that leads to a problem because in every disease state that is chronic, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines are associated with poor outcomes. The higher the IL-6, the higher the TNF-alpha, the higher the IL-1, the more likely the patients are dying. And again, the average CRP or IL-6 concentration is almost three to four-fold higher in the setting of kidney disease, at times going up to 10 to 20 times higher. That indicates that there's a problem with this issue. And again, if you go back and look at what inflammation does, this is an oversimplification of the metabolic effects of inflammation here. There are a bunch of things that are happening and if you really replace this inflammation, this is exactly what we've been telling about uremia. All of these things that we see in the setting of advanced kidney disease metabolically are almost identical to what you see in the setting of inflammation. 
to the point that people have suggested that there is a cause and effect relationship between the two. And indeed, uh, this is a study that we've completed very recently, I'm just going to go through very quickly, that looks at the skeletal protein turnover in terms of its components. This is synthesis, this is breakdown, and this is the net balance. Divided into quartiles of CRP at the setting of a metabolic study. As you can see, as the CRP concentrations go up, there's a significant drop in the synthetic rate. As the CRP goes up, there's this nice increase, bad for the patients, a breakdown. And the net balance is a negative balance that goes substantially more robust and negative as the CRP goes up. This is in 130 or so humans, which I've never seen in the humans such a nice correlation indicating that there is a real problem in the setting of kidney disease, inflammation causing problems. And the last question is, is the disease state responsive to nutritional sp specific nutritional intervention? Indeed it does, but again, it's very complex. In the setting of chronic kidney disease, I've told you, we would like to limit the amount of protein intake, for example. And there are a bunch of reasons to do that. This is just a slide indicating why one should actually limit the amount of protein intake less than 0.6 per gram per kilogram per day. And indeed, if you look at meta-analyses, protein restriction actually delays the glomerular filtration rate decline by an average of 0.5 ml per minute per year. Now, the opposite is true for kidney disease if you're on a dialysis patient. That is, if you actually provide additional protein to individuals during dialysis at the setting of this catabolic effect, you can actually completely reverse the whole process and in initiate a robust anabolic response. This is a study doing, looking at the same patient population. Again, whole body protein metabolism over here. The open bars are fasting. The gray bars are giving people intravenous intradialytic parenteral nutrition. The black bars are the oral nutritional supplementation given during dialysis. As you can see, if you look at the net balance, you can completely revert that catabolic process. And this is, amounts to about two grams per kilogram per day of, uh, per day of protein to, to these individuals, ups, totally opposite of what we would be doing in the setting of chronic kidney disease. And again, uh, just to let you know that if you really give nutritional supplementations for a long period of time, there are a number of randomized clinical trials that suggest that there are benefits in the intermediate surrogate outcomes of nutritional state, such as serum albumin, prealbumin, and again, I have to go back here, uh, weight, body weight, lean body mass, bone density, physical function, and so on and so forth. Now, I do also have to admit that there's more than just giving nutrients to people because there seems to be a problem in the machinery. And I'm going to go back and talk about this because there was a lot of discussion about mitochondria. We've, done, we've recently completed a study looking at the effects of nutritional supplementation using a dual clamp procedure to look at insulin sensitivity. That is, we actually took dialysis patients and controls and implemented a dual glucose amino acid clamp to look at the changes in muscle protein signaling. That is, in the setting of single clamp where you have glucose disposal rate, and the ratio of total AKT to uh, phosphorylated AKT in the muscle tissue obtained from the muscle biopsies. In healthy controls, when you clamp these individuals, there's a nice correlation of AKT, phosphorylated AKT going up, indicating that there's an anabolic response. But if you look at the dialysis patients, during a clamp, single clamp or a dual clamp, where you give people amino acids at the same time, there is no response at all. So this indicates that there's some problem when you give these nutrients to individuals that they cannot metabolize. And the bottom line is, if you look at the actual muscle tissue itself under electron microscopy, you can see some significant problems in the mitochondria where the energy process is happening. I'm not a histopathologist, and you don't have to really differentiate these two from the, each other. This is a normal mitochondria, and this is a swollen mitochondria over here. I still put some white arrows just in case. But these are really abnormal. And what happens is that if you look at the mitochondria itself, there's a huge amount of fat deposition indicating that the mitochondria it's itself is not working in these individuals. So there's some acquired problem in the muscle tissue, whether it's related to kidney disease or something else, it's unknown, that really limits the benefits of this nutritional supplementation in the setting of chronic kidney disease. What about fat? Uh, this will be very quick. There's very little to no studies in terms of fat intake in the setting of chronic kidney disease. What we do is just do whatever the general population does. 
you know, healthy diets, saturated, not too much saturated fat, maybe use omega-3 fatty acids, but the information that's available to us from randomized trials is zero. What about vitamins and trace elements? Still, very limited information, especially the last two or three decades, there have been no studies in terms of looking at the needs and the replacement of uh, trace elements or vitamins. We usually uh, tell people that, and this is true, that water-soluble vitamins are usually lost in dialysis, so you really need to replace them as much as possible. But we have not been able to show that people are really, really depleted. Uh, Fat-soluble vitamins are actually, could be risky because they accumulate in the setting of kidney disease, especially vitamin A. And then trace elements is a complete unknown for us. Let me finish with one last slide, and this is the last one. And I can take a day, much like one of the other speakers have said, this is the first of the 15 that's coming up. But I put it into one, and there are a lot of gaps in information. There's a lot of information that one can actually look into in terms of research. Uh, I think the role of the human microbiome and the uremic toxins is really intriguing. And there's been some uh, discussion uh, Dr. Ney has told about. There's a lot of data that's coming up right now, and it's really interesting. We do not know how to better the dialysis procedure itself. We do not know what the optimal level of supplementation, and we do not know how the anabolic or anti-catabolic strategies really work in the setting of kidney disease. With that, I'll stop, and thank you very much. And this is the crowd that helped me out. <laughs>